Hey everyone, um, welcome, thank you so much. So uh, my name is, is Roy Lindsay and I am uh, delighted to welcome you to the fourth event in our series, Buddhism and Post-Humanism. Um, today, we are very lucky to be joined by uh, Kalsang Dorje Bhutia from University of California, Riverside. And his talk is titled, The Chili and the Bears Are My Uncles, Buddhist Interspecies Relations in and Beyond West Sakim. And we have uh, one more scheduled event uh, on March 24th. That's with Becky Lachunyapa of the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And her talk is titled Mother Wisdom, Learning to Embody Interdependence in the Anthropocene. I'm going to full screen this. So just a little bit about our series. So the series is co-sponsored by the Host Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Toronto and the Religion and the Public Sphere Initiative, which is based at the Department for the Study of Religion at U of T. Uh, the series examines the place of humans in our world, how humans relate to other animals, and the consequences of anthropocentric attitudes. It looks to explore how Buddhist traditions understand relationships between humans and non-humans, and how those traditions might confront destructive human behaviors connected with animals and with climate change. Um, we're holding these meetings on Zoom to facilitate a broader accessibility and participation. And just, just a few minutes ago, Kao Song made the great point that uh, by avoiding flying people to Toronto, we are also <laughs> very much in line with our environmental concerns. Um, and so some of our events, as you already probably know, uh, had materials that were circulated beforehand. And so you can always find those on the Ho Center website. Um, we wanted to start with uh, our land acknowledgement. So the University of Toronto operates on land that for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, just a little bit more about today's meeting, uh, but this particular Zoom session. So it is being recorded because we, we are sharing these events uh, uh, on YouTube afterward. Um, uh, but your names and the chat are not being recorded. Uh, we're gonna edit the recording and post it to our YouTube channel, but it's also being live streamed. So there's a live stream version on YouTube. And then in the end, we'll just sort of clean up the, the beginning and the end for the, the final product. Um, there is going to be a Q&A session at the end of, of, of our session today. Um, and so you can raise your hand in Zoom and unmute yourself uh, to ask the question and I'll, I'll call on people. Um, keep yourself muted, please, uh, in the meantime, just to limit background noise. Uh, and uh, you're always welcome to post comments in the chat uh, as we go. Um, okay, and now actually we can introduce our speaker. So. Uh, Kelsen Dorje Butia, he is a visiting scholar currently in the Asian Studies program at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Kelsen Law holds a PhD in Buddhist studies from the University of Delhi, which uh, he received in 2014. And his dissertation focuses on the role of Buddhism as an anti-colonial force as depicted in a Tibetan language work on the history of Sakim, the uh, Drejong Gyarup. Uh, Kelsen has a very Impressive CV has a long list of uh, academic articles uh, and everything I've read by him has been really inspiring. And so we're really lucky to have him here today. Um, his research focuses on environmental and interspecies histories of the Himalayas, on local responses to climate change in the Himalayas, uh, Buddhism and ecology, environmental and traditional law in South and uh, in East Asia. And finally on local uh, de uh, and decolonial histories of the Himalayas. Uh, Kelsung was awarded in 2021 the position of the Dalai Lama Fellow, uh, the Foundation of, uh, for Universal Responsibility. Uh, and in 2019, he was the Robert H. N. Ho Research Fellow in Buddhist Studies uh, as part of the American Council of Learned, Learned Societies. Um, Kelsung asked me to keep the intro short, so, <laughs> so I will do so. Uh, and I will come back to you so you can see me. Um, and so one thing I'll say before we start today is that um, like my own internet connection, which is very inconsistent, uh, Kelsang was having trouble with his recently. And so he decided uh, to pre-record the talk 
and share with us. And then we could stream it from the university, uh, you know, internet connection that we have in Toronto, which is much more stable. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, uh, show the video of his talk and then we'll have a live Q and A after. So uh, Betsy, do you wanna uh, cue the, the video? Thanks. Kuzambo Kamri Mo Sewaru Tashidale. My name is Kalzang Dozi Butia, and I greet all of you with hope that you all are keeping safe and healthy in these challenging times. Uh, I'm speaking from Los Angeles, the land of Tongva people. I uh, thank my gracious host in Toronto, uh, Professor Rory Lindsay and uh, Professor Francis Garrett uh, for this opportunity. Uh, finally, I acknowledge the beings in my homeland of Sikkim, which I will discuss today, uh, including um, all the uh, protected deities in my community at home. And beginning with that, I'll just show you a quickly a map uh, of all the sacred sites, which all these uh, deities um, are uh, staying. So today I will talk about uh, post post human and beyond human relationships by talking about uh, something that can all bring us joy in these times, and that is uh, nothing other than uh, food, oh, shella. <laughs> So some of the items that I'm gonna talk about it uh, today, and uh, and particularly, yeah, the uh, the surprising recent rise to fame of one of the uh, staples in my home region, uh, in the, that happened in 2017. Uh, one of my sister-in-law informed me of a surprising uh, development in my village in West Sikkim. Uh, a number of our extended families were changing their usual agricultural uh, planting patterns. Uh, usually, instead of planting uh, staples such as uh, maize and mustard greens in the kitchen gardens, uh, they were uh, planting a, a popular chili, uh, which in, uh, in the Bhutia language, uh, we call it uh, akubari, you know. Uh, yeah. So this chili is uh, also known as uh, uh, dalle korsani. Uh, <laughs> dalle korsani in Nepali, uh, the mostly uh, spoken language in in the uh, multilingual and multi-ethnic state of Sikkim in the Indian Himalayas. Uh, dalle here means. Uh, round, okay, so it's kind of a round chili. <laughs> uh, so from the family of, uh, you know, Solanese and the genius capsicum uh, enum, uh, all of these different ethnic communities of Sikkim, uh, which includes all the people, including Bhutia, Lepchas, Suba, also known as Tsongs, and Sherpa, Chetri, Newar, Mongols, you know, all the communities uh, and many more, uh, they all enjoy this chili, uh, Akubari. Uh, this change to usual crop pattern was due to uh, economic incentive. Uh, that is an agent from Patanjali, I think you all know uh, the famous Patanjali and internationally, um, a known Indian household brand uh, run by the global uh, yoga guru, uh, yoga guru famously known as uh, Ramdev, uh, yoga guru Ramdev. Uh, there was a rumor saying that saying that uh, yoga guru Ramdev visited the area, that's the uh, uh, West Sikkim area, and uh, supposedly he has told all the farmers that he wanted to buy their crops. Uh, so Akubari was sought after by Patanjali uh, to produce uh, and promote Akubari-based pickle. 
uh, pickles and sauces uh, for their brand. Uh, so uh, the interest in this homegrown staple was accepted with uh, enthusiasm, uh, but also surprise. Uh, yeah, so this surprise was uh, derived from the heat associated with Akubari, you know, which I'm going to uh, explore further. Uh, so this small round chili, which is known as Dali uh, chili, looks deceptively like a uh, a red cherry, which is why in English it is often referred to as red hot cherry uh, cherry pepper. That sounds like a, a band name. <laughs> uh, but locals of the small northeast Indian state of Sikkim uh, and in the nearby Darjeeling region uh, have been uh, you know, they've been uh, historically very cautious about the amount that they serve to their guests. Uh, <laughs> because of the hotness. So Akubare has been uh, uh, rated in the range of uh, somewhere around 100,000 to uh, uh, 350,000 Scoville uh, heat units. Uh, so this is uh, less spicy than the, uh, the famous uh, Northeast Indian Bhut Jolokya. They call it Bhut Jolokya, but translated into English known as the ghost chili. You know, which is very popular these days, even in West, uh, or known as you know, Naga Jolokia, since it's very popular in Nagaland, uh, in the northeastern uh, part of the Indian state. Uh, so within local households, um, across the different ethnic and cultural and religious communities of Sikkim and Darjeeling region, uh, Akubari is a spicy staple. Uh, served either raw, just like that you can see in the PowerPoint, um, raw and sometimes like sliced up, um, got that pungency, or as a pickle or a dipped in sauce. Uh, you can find them on the sides of uh, rice plates, okay, it's served with uh, rice, uh, dal bath, sabji, uh, with lentils, vegetables, uh, meat, and other local delicacies, uh, you often find them uh, when you actually go to uh, local places. In Bhutia language, the word we use akubari uh, is revealing for what it tells us about the role of this uh, chili in uh, cultivating commensality in our communities. Aku uh, literally means uh, uncle and uh, bari means uh, blazing. <laughs> so, uh, um, so bari it means uh, blazing. So if you put those words, it becomes like blazing uncle. <laughs> it's, it's kind of very uh, deadly, <laughs> blazing uncle. Uh, so akubari is considered to be a kin, uh, a family member. Uh, uh, but one that should be respected uh, for its power. Uh, so in this presentation, I will refer to him with, with a masculine pronoun uh, to acknowledge this agency. So then the question arises, what happens when uh, Uncle Chili, as I will refer to him here, uh, moves from or uh, moves beyond the kitchen gardens and forest of Sikkim. In many ways, the sudden growth in interest in Uncle Chili is not surprising, given the growth in interest in exotic uh, forms of chilies documented around the world in the last three decades. And uh, the rise of uh, Sikkim State as a, a popular uh, tourist destination and for the state government's um, organic green initiatives. Uh, but these initiatives have been critiqued uh, for their hypocrisies, as while uh, Sikkim is supposedly, uh, supposedly organic and environmentally friendly, uh, the government has allowed for unprecedented infrastructure projects to proceed that have 
been uh, environmentally destructive. Uh, these projects, including many uh, mega dams, have inspired activism in response to detrimental impacts of such uh, new liberal intervention. The movement of Uncle Chilli from the tables of rural communities in Sikkim and, and Darjeeling to the tables of urban India can be read as yet another example of uh, new liberal exploitation. In this instance, uh, of traditional food waste. Here, I want to uh, trace the moment of uh, Uncle Chilli as a way to think about the changing economic or changing economics of uh, value and scale around him, and uh, what the popularity of this chili suggests to us about uh, changing interspecies relations in the Himalayas. Uncle Chili is famous vividly demonstrated when in, in August 2020, uh, the Department of uh, Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade of the Government of India granted a geographic indicator tag to him. The GI tag uh, recognition was hailed in the, in the local media as an excellent marketing opportunity for Akubari pickle and some other Sikkimese products. It also represents the latest episodes in the historical promotion of Northeast India as Empire's Garden uh, to borrow the uh, wonderful work, uh, wonderful uh, University of Toronto historian Jayata Sharma, uh, Jayata Sharma's tomb. Uh, this also demonstrates Sikkim's position as a commodity forest. Sikkim first appeared on maps of uh, British Empire due to its proximity to Tibet and for its many uh, botanical species. Orchids and tea were both found in the forest of Sikkim and uh, removed with other commodity items for imperial uh, consumption. So this was accompanied by the development of plantation labor economics and the decimation of local sovereignty. In uh, 1835, Darjeeling was leased by the British administration from King of Sikkim in order to establish tea gardens. In the 1849, Darjeeling was annexed from Sikkim. In the decades following this incident, Sikkim came under the control of uh, British. And by the time it was observed by India in 1975, had already been controlled by political officers for decades and uh, private companies also opened. <clears throat> Uncle Chili was first produced commercially in Sikkim in 1996. And uh, this led to the creation of many uh, local kickling uh, companies that came up. The success of these companies paved way for Patanjali, but the creation of Akubari as a product can be traced back to its position as the fueler of uh, commensality. To consider this position, uh, we must move back to examine whether Akubari is held to have, uh, where Akubari is held to have come from. Uh, Akubari in kitchen gardens with, with seeds taken from the forest. Almost half of the uh, Sikkim, Sikkim is covered by uh, thick forest uh, since the uh, uh, I forgot to show this uh, um, clip. This is when uh, Akubari got the GI tag. Uh, so, yeah, so as I was saying, almost half of the state of Sikkim is covered by thick forest since the uh, terrain varies so greatly from mountainous areas to low river valleys. 
uh, there are number of different forest types and many species in it. In his in 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 historical lecture, Butia and Suba communities in West Sikkim, the forest was uh, regarded as an integral uh, in, in, integral element of everyday life. Uh, in that, you can find all sorts of uh, other uh, things like mushrooms and herbs uh, provided food. Uh, fallen branches made food for the fire. And shelter was hewn from trees. The forest was not only a uh, place for resources for human extraction. Uh, it was understood as part of an uh, interspecies matrix inhabited by spirits and deities and needed careful and respectful care to continue to establish human flourishing and uh, who were and continue to be frequently considered as kin or extended family for human Buddhist communities in West Sikkim. Uh, in Buddhist traditions, these beings were known as uh, uh, Dharma protectors of the land, um, word used as locally known as in Buddhist as Che Kyung, uh, sometimes also known as Yula and Jida. And Buddhism met with uh, local traditions to develop a set of ritual practices to uh, facilitate communications and care between humans and non-humans of Sikkim Sikkim habitat. Some of this care um, took the form of local prohibitions against cutting down trees or guidance about where to dispose of human waste to avoid uh, polluting rivers and streams that brought water to human settlements from the glaciers above, or very clean uh, glaciers. Indigenous lecture and Buddhist ritual life um, was concerned with educating humans on appropriate interactions with the uh, forest. A local healing system known as green or herbal uh, medicine in Bhutia known as Homen, was practiced among villagers in Sikkim. Uh, it represented a synthesis of indigenous literature and imported Tibetan Buddhist and other local uh, medical practices and continues in contemporary communities where it is part of the rich uh, medical diversity of Sikkim that includes uh, Buddhist, Lecha, Jagri, Damai, Ayurvedic, Allopathic, and other forms of <clears throat> uh, medicine. The practitioners of Homen include Lecha Bongtings, uh, which is the Bongting um, equivalent of shamans, and Bhutia healers, and other medical practitioners that do not always carry titles, but are respected for carrying the knowledge of healing. To green medicine practitioners, the forest is a living garden uh, filled with kin and relations. And their initiation and training gained during apprenticeship with senior healers provides them with a deep knowledge of the different elements of this garden. Uh, Ajo Wangyal, a uh, woman practitioner, described this knowledge to me personally, and in his words, quote, Norman introduces us to the door of the forest. We need to know where the door is to enter. You cannot just enter from anywhere. If you are looking for something in particular, you need to tell the forest what it is by introducing yourself with a chant and mantra when you arrive. The forest will then help you to find what it is you need, but you should only take what is necessary." End quote. This concern for not depleting the forest is central to the balance that home and practitioners strive to achieve. 
this balance will make humans and other beings around them healthy, human, humans and non-humans. This balance will lead to lack of harmony and illness. Um, the concern for depletion was important. Early texts about Sikkim's landscape represent it as a place of abundance. In indigenous cosmologies, uh, Lepcha or wrong communities considered uh, Sikkim to be Maya Liam in their term, the wrong term, uh, wrong which means Lepcha, in the, in the Lepcha term. Uh, the original name of Sikkim was known as Maya Liang, which means uh, heavenly paradise on earth. Uh, in Buddhist cosmology, Sikkim was historically conceived of as a, uh, a hidden land uh, or known as uh, a bayou uh, set, as, set aside by the great uh, tantric master Guru Rinpoche in the 8th century to act as a safe haven for Tibetan Buddhists. Um, after the departure of Guru Rinpoche, uh, over the following centuries, a number of yogis associated with his lineage uh, visited Sikkim and wrote numerous uh, pilgrimage guidebooks to the sacred habitat uh, that vividly describes its abundance. So this abundance was understood to be represented by many edible elements of the forest. Uh, even in contemporary Sikkim, uh, foraged food from the forest features in many dishes. And uh, Uncle Chile is one of them. Uh, Uncle Chile is considered to be a, a forest derived chili. And this has uh, contributed to the belief that Uncle Childi are a, a native plant, a very important uh, statement there. <laughs> Uncle Childi are used in medicinal diets to help treat uh, stomach ulcers and other uh, gastrointestinal issues. And important reason for this is that uh, they do not cause discomfort during digestion and bowel movements. It means it doesn't uh, uh, burn. Um, uh, the heat is not as severe uh, because you can tell from the uh, easy bowel movements. Uh, Uncle Chili can also be an appetizer and are seen as efficacious for people experiencing nausea. And Uncle Chili, along with other forest foods, uh, may well have originated in other parts of the world, uh, but their habituation to Sikkim's uh, forest and widespread use has rendered them as local. So in West Sikkim, uh, the forest is a place of abundance, but also uh, danger, uh, which is quite interesting in that way. Uh, special spiritual preparation is needed to successfully forage in the forest. Uh, this spiritual preparation is tied to acknowledging the other inhabitants of the forest. Uh, these inhabitants include uh, spirits and non-human animals. Uh, in Sikkimese Buddhism, uh, many of these animals, including uh, the red pandas, which is very popular, it's a, a national animal. Uh, red pandas, flying squirrels, uh, tigers, which is very rare now, uh, boars and bears, and even birds are considered to be uh, protected deities of the region. Uh, many mammals live in high altitude forests rather than near villages. However, uh, Himalayan brown bears <laughs> and tree bears are quite common. Uh, in West Sikkim, they are uh, referred to in Bhutia as Akutom, uh, which means uh, Uncle Bear. <laughs> uh, so then question arises, uh, what does this title reflect about uh, interspecies relationships in uh, West Sikkim. 
uh, do people understand bears to be their uncles? Uh, such naming indicates another form um, of the types of uh, relatedness uh, chronicled by anthropologist uh, Radhika Govindrajan in her ethnography of interspecies relations in her research in the uh, central Himalayas. Uh, in Bhutia language, the use of the term aku uh, is specially loaded. Uh, I've already talked about the meaning of aku, which means uncle. Uh, so use of aku, which is uncle, uh, is actually uh, very loaded. Uh, this is due to the uh, patriarchal context of Sikhanese society, where uh, uncles play a significant role as uh, father figure replacements. Uh, uh, they can be also as mediators for um, arranging marriages. Uh, they are also uh, uh, very important for settling land disputes and other forms of community ties. Uh, we can talk about that uh, later. Uh, their significance and authority to shape the lives of those within their family groups makes the title Aku uh, representative of power and need for respect. So Akubari is uh, named Akubari because it is uh, a chili worthy of respect. Uh, Rinchen Chogil, a uh, man in his 90s, uh, explained to me that in his words, uh, quote, uh, Akubari are so hot <laughs> and they can, uh, they can burst your heart. Oh my God. They can burst your heart. You need to be careful with them and eat them slowly or uh, tempered with other flavors. Otherwise, your heart will burst. In the same way, Akutam, uh, Uncle Bear, <laughs> are deadly. Uh, you need to avoid them. Or if you see one, get down on the ground. <laughs> get down on the ground. Um, Akubari and Akutam are, are uncles. Uh, because we need to respect them. Uh, if we do, we can live together, unquote. <laughs> um, yeah, the title of Aku is there for uh, cautionary uh, cautions. Uh, it's the use establishes relations between humans and other species in the landscape and uh, it demands, I think, appropriate uh, interactions. Uh, in an extension of appropriate relations, uh, bari, meaning uh, to blaze or uh, burn, which is the, the chili, bari, uh, which means blaze or burn, can also be used as a name for humans, uh, very interestingly. Uh, in Vesikim, it is uh, regularly used as part of an informal name in in the in Bhutian Lepcha communities to uh, indicate that an individual is quick to anger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the nickname acts as a warning to people approaching, uh, approaching the body, approaching uh, he or her or they, <laughs> approaching them to be aware of their temper uh, because they are so hot that without any reason, they might just <laughs> spark at you. <laughs> and it is, uh, Additionally, a way to uh, 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 chastise the bearer of the name uh, to take care of, to take care to control, uh, to you know, control the angle, basically. Uh, so yeah, it has got uh, many uh, connotations there. So this connections to uh, ethics and relationship is illustrative of broader way that Akubari fuels uh, relations. Uh, Akubari are no longer commonly found in the forest, uh, but these days instead they can find them in kitchen gardens near <coughs> rural houses. And uh, you can find them in pots in the terraces in the urban uh, uh, settings, in the urban houses, uh, where they are cultivated for cooking, 
uh, fermenting uh, and even as medicines. Uh, hospitality and commensality are major concerns in Sikkimese life. In the Buddhist Bhutia communities in rural West Sikkim, interpersonal relations are highly uh, mediated using body language and, uh, uh, and language registers according to different ethnic and religious groups. And these concerns for acknowledging um, hierarchy are also embedded in relationships with other non-human inhabitants of the land. Uh, many regular Buddhist rituals held in Sikkimese domestic shrines are related in some way to uh, uh, hospitality and uh, feedings. Uh, chilies are not directly offered to the deities in these rituals, uh, but they are offered to, uh, to lamas and other ritual officials, uh, along with other delicacies such as uh, gyari and momo. Uh, which is um, famously uh, known as momos, dumplings, as well as other products from kitchen gardens, including uh, cow milk cheese, uh, uh, millet derived beer known as chung. Uh, so yeah, so Akubari helps to balance uh, food and taste and is believed to heighten enjoyment, uh, thereby fueling the uh, rituals. <laughs> so uh, Akubari are also offered to the deities indirectly uh, uh, through their non-human consumers. Here it's very interesting. Uh, um, you can find this. A frequent lament, uh, I'm sorry to show, show this late. Uh, these are some of the delicacies that you find, and you can see in the middle, uh, there is uh, akubari pickle, chilies at the side uh, here, it's dumplings, momo. And of course, yari, I can't show it today because that, that is much more traditional. This is more of a tourist uh, kind of uh, food. And you have different sorts of uh, akubari pickle here with different other pickles, must be uh, bamboo shoots there. And then uh, mushroom, uh, not mushroom, I'm sorry, uh, uh, dumplings, momos, with again, uh, uh, pickle there in the middle. Uh, so yeah, uh, so apart from that, akubaris are also offered to the deities indirectly through their non-human consumers. A uh, frequent lament during the harvest times for Akubari is that farmers all too often find them on the ground already consumed. Uh, because there is uh, one uh, you know, bird that actually attacks this chili. <laughs> and uh, this non-human culprit is none other than, um, uh, in Bhutia it's called, the name of the bird is called Tefinam. And in Nepali, uh, it's known as Kalchuda, Kalchura. Um, and Tefinam, the Bhutia name, also can be, uh, uh, there's also a different name uh, for Tefinam, which is also known as uh, Hlai Pichung. Uh, Hlai Pichung means the uh, bird of the gods. Um, uh, in English, it's known as the blue whistling thrush, a common species uh, of bird that is found in, in the, throughout Sikkim. So uh, these small birds uh, are famous for their distinctive uh, kind of uh, songs. Uh, they have got a very sweet uh, singing tones. And the epinoms are heard twice in a day uh, singing, uh, especially in the morning hours. Uh, somewhere it'll start somewhere around 6.30, uh, which is very early. Uh, and then uh, it sings around uh, evening times, uh, which is around 4.30 to 5. Uh, and are associated with uh, Buddhist practice of uh, making uh, water offerings in the domestic shrines. So in the morning when Tefinam sings, it means um, uh, 
uh, it's time for offering chopper. Uh, uh, in the morning, they are believed to uh, wake up uh, some blurring Buddhists to get them to make morning offerings because generally people are a bit lazy in the morning. So whenever they hear the song of Devinan, uh, it makes them actually wake up <laughs> from the bed. Uh, whereas in the evening time, uh, they remind people to empty the water bowls and uh, clean the chusham, uh, uh, clean the shrine. So Tefinam have an unusual appetite for uh, akubari. If there's one uh, human or non-human, uh, you know, species that is to attack uh, akubari, it's none other than this bird. Uh, so akubari is seen then as a fuel for their uh, prayer reminders, uh, and therefore plays an important role as uh, part in an interspecies chain of offerings. So they can also uh, they can also be uh, the interesting part is they can also be offering in themselves, uh, <laughs> which is quite sad actually. Uh, the the bodies of newly hatched tefinum uh, chicks, you know, when they're very very young. Um, they are sought after by healers uh, as they are held to be effective medicine for uh, respiration problems and even piles. Ooh, that's, that's a bad, bad news for Tefinam there. In response, uh, Tefinam, they build their nest in a very difficult uh, places. Like for example, in uh, stream areas or in the rivers and even in the gorge where it would be very difficult for humans to trace their nest. Uh, so yeah, Akubari is therefore the central point in the, an intersecting system of uh, relatedness. Uh, eating and commensality fuse part of this system, uh, but behavioral and ethical guidance is also part of what makes Akubari so tasty as food uh, for thought in, in village. Second. <clears throat> so how did Uncle Chili become popular and known to companies such as Patanjal? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, this shift to new scales reflects uh, Sikkim's history. Uh, in the decades after Sikkim became part of India in 1975, uh, new roads and hotels were uh, built to cater for growing tourist industry. Uh, well, there was an inflow of tourists seeking the mountain vista views. Uh, there was also an outflow of Sikkimese young people seeking education. And as time went on, employment in the cities on the plains. For Sikkimese migrants, the cities were as sites of opportunity and education, uh, places to gain experience, uh, that they took back <clears throat> with them to uh, their state. In the cities of India, uh, Sikkimese migrants often band together with other noticed people uh, due to shared experiences of prejudice and uh, racism. The wonderful noticed Indian anthropologist Dolly Kikon has written powerfully about how this prejudice and racism is often connected to food differences. Sikkim's young people from across different ethnic and cultural groups that I interviewed, uh, who had studied throughout uh, in, in the cities of uh, Delhi, uh, Calcutta, Mumbai, Chennai, and other important places, uh, relate to me uh, their excitement about returning to Sikkim uh, during holidays so that they could uh, eat and beef and pork and some of their other favorite delicacies. Uh, for many years, uh, Akubari pickle was homemade and sent with students uh, packaged in recycled, uh, what they call known as the Horlicks bottles. Uh, or Horlicks uh, containers. That's Horlicks is a, a drink. Uh, so whenever the drink uh, finishes, the empty bottles uh, are used as uh, uh, chili containers. So in the 2010s, 
uh, most Sikkimese young people stayed on in cities after they found employment after uh, soon after their graduation. So this meant that there was an increased demand for akubari uh, pico, or akubari chili, in the Indian urban centers, which has led to the development of mass factory production and entrance of national chains such as uh, Patanjali. Uh, corporate interest in Akubari and its potential for mass production and the uh, GI uh, tag have been loaded for the opportunities they will bring to Sydney's producers. But ultimately, as Sarah Besky's work on Darjeeling tea has suggested, the benefits of uh, factories and GI tags respectively do not always filter down evenly to those performing the labor or communities who live around or are displaced by production centers. In Sikkim, the growth of interest around Akubari led the price per kilogram to drop because so many farmers were growing it with the hope that Patanjali would uh, purchase their crops. In villages in Sikkim, anxieties about popularization and commodification of Akubari and the potential downsides of the GI tag are not often the center point of discussion. Uh, instead, uh, concerns and questions about Akubari's change of status uh, revolve around a crucial element of Akubari, uh, that is its taste. Uh, the taste uh, that, that matters. In West Sikkim, uh, Selron Bichin, a woman uh, in her 90s who began growing akubari in her kitchen uh, since her childhood days, uh, lamented to me uh, as follows, you know, in her words, quote, akubari doesn't taste the same anymore. It just isn't as hot. That flavor is in there. When we were young, uh, there is no way one people could have eaten an entire akubari with a plate of food. We just needed the tiniest sliver to get the taste. I would use just the tiniest sliver in making an entire karai of fried rice for my children. Uh, but now you see, uh, people can eat the entire pickle akubari without any problem and cold. Uh, so she speculated that the decline in spice, uh, maybe due to the commercial growing practices now uh, common for Akubari. Her friend Pasanki, uh, a lecture woman from the same village, agreed. Uh, in Pasanki's words, um, Akubari had such a strong and a distinctive smell. Uh, there was nothing like it. Uh, these new ones are different. Uh, they are less delicious. Uh, such concerns were echoed by many other community members that I talked to from across different uh, ethnic and age groups. When I mentioned the Scoville score or the Scoville scale measurement, uh, that put Akubari at a much lower pungency than the Budjolokia or the ghost chili. Uh, they were uh, incredulous and stated that uh, this was further evidence that Akubari has been modified as it has spread. Just as Akubari be, be, becomes accessible to unprecedented consumers and is claimed as an exemplar of Sikkimese identity, the authenticity of this widely available Akubari is contested by Sikkimese consumers and King. The multi-species relationships that connected Uncle Chili to human and avian residents in West Sikkim have changed as Akubari has gone from being a local crop grown for household consumption to nationally uh, circulated commodity pickled in uh, large factories. These changes represent new economic opportunities for villagers and alternative model to monocrop cash crop that dominate West Sikkimese agriculture and generate new com communities for urban Sikkimese migrants. But they also bring new forms of uh, inequality and uh, fundamental change in commensality and kinship across species and beyond the humans. Concerns about authenticity, 
reflect these changes. The question remains, in the future, will there be enough fungal chili to go around? And will Akubari's status as an uncle continue to be acknowledged? Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And Toji Chila. Thank you so much. Um, Kasungla, if you could uh, join us by video and unmute, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but if, if someone wants to go ahead of me, that's totally fine. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start. So uh, the, the first question I have for you is to do with the blue bird that you described. I was trying to sort of get a sense of what the relationship is between you know, your community and this particular bird, because it seemed it was mixed in the sense that you described the bird as like attacking Akubari, <laughs> but then also as a prompt for ritual practices. And it, I, I'm trying to get a sense of whether that bird is seen as like a, a, in a positive light as a community member or as in some way antagonistic given it, it's attacking Akubari. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, thank you, La. thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for everyone uh, uh, for joining. And uh, yeah, uh, regarding the bird Tefinam, uh, uh, which is called uh, Kultura in Nepali. Um, yeah, it does actually have a positive kind of uh, take. Uh, mm -hmm. The bird is uh, actually very respected. You can uh, already tell from the title that has already, uh, you know, um, achieved, uh, known as uh, Hlai Pichung. Uh, that is a term used in uh, uh, Bhutia, Bhutia language. Pichung means uh, bird. So it's a god's bird, a bird of, bird of the gods uh, to remind, <laughs> as, as I've just put it in my uh, slide and the PowerPoint, uh, to remind to the people that the to, to us kind of away from the slumbering stage, you know. Maybe basically uh, people can get very lazy. Um, <laughs> second is term, uh, they, mm -hmm. they call it gona mi, gona mi shelo. So mm -hmm. in order to rise them from the bed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when they hear this tone, uh, especially for practitioners, it, it's a, it's a reminder saying, oh, you know, I can't be sleeping because <laughs> the bird is, <laughs> bird is already uh, signaling. It's like an alarm, mm -hmm. uh, alarm clock for practitioners. So it does have a very uh, kind of a high name, uh, mm -hmm. kind of respected uh, in that way. Um, and, uh, and practitioners especially relate uh, very much with Tefinam especially even for keeping time. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bird, very clever bird. Uh, mm. it, 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 it's an alarm, it's, it's like a modern <laughs> kind of Apple watch <laughs> during those days. <laughs> um, and so when, when the bird uh, sings, uh, then it's especially in the evening, uh, morning time generally people, I, that's what I heard from uh, seniors, uh, uh, practitioners and other non-practitioners. In the morning hours, it's usually people can tell like it's time to wake up. But especially during the evening time, when you are so busy with your daily activities, um, you forget uh, at times to uh, do 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 away with chopper uh, to to do 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 away with the uh, chopper bowls, the seven uh, seven bowls, the offering. So usually people get very busy and they lose their time. But this right. bird, uh, whenever uh, you hear them sing around 4.30 to 5, then that, that's, a, that's a really good uh, kind of a coverage so that you actually alert yourself and this, oh, I should go back and uh, do away the chopper. You know, so it's actually mm -hmm. a very positive 
uh, kind of support for uh, practitioners as well as non-practitioners. Uh, non-practitioners who are in the village setup. And the other question, uh, the downside of uh, Tefinam, I think uh, mm. Buddhist practitioners, I think they're, they're generally very uh, compassionate, uh, not only with Tefinam, uh, especially practitioners, they uh, have compassion for all sentient beings. Uh, that's, that's understood. Uh, but uh, for the uh, non-practitioners, uh, especially those farmers uh, who are farming this akubari, right, uh, in, their, in their garden, and you can just imagine, especially after uh, the rumor of Patanjali <laughs> coming mm. to those villages and uh, exciting uh, all the villagers to uh, plant in large quantities. And they certainly, they have their minds blown up uh, thinking like they can have uh, a lot of money, uh, which is a mm. replacement of uh, kind of mono cash crop that I talked in my paper. Uh, that's have a cardamom. You know, and there's another crop, uh, Sikkim was very uh, famous, is the large cardamoms, uh, which actually, there was a blight. And, uh, and <clears throat> for that reason, there was no good harvest. So in order to replace that, uh, you know, farmers were excited to actually see uh, what can Akubari bring change? Can Akubari replace uh, cardamom? Uh, mm. So in that in that process, they were super excited and they planted uh, uh, these red chilies, uh, akubari on large quantities. In, in fact, you can see like not only the kitchen garden, some sometimes you can see the whole field fully mm. Uh, mm. with akubari plantation. And I'm talking in that terms. Uh, so in that terms, when uh, Tefinam gets inside and does his job, <laughs> Uh, I think right. Tefinam, I think, uh, had a kind of a tough time. <laughs> uh, very respectfully put, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed we have a question in the chat. Maybe I'll go to that. So uh, it says, Dale Kursani is one of my daily intake. Just a question. If there is a possibility that the flaming extreme flavor of Akubari enhance the emotion or temptation that deter people uh, for peaceful meditation or mind of meditation. So does, is, the, is Akubari, you know, influencing meditation in some way? Uh, that's a good question. No? That's a really good yeah. question. And I've been uh, thinking about it for a long, long time. Uh, will flavor and uh, pungency and uh, taste, uh, does it have connection with meditation? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Uh, even if you follow the Vinaya rules, uh, in the Vinaya, it talks about certain food, uh, certain like hot food, like spicy foods, uh, whether they are good for uh, meditative uh, practice uh, or not. Um, the certain foods like, for example, garlic and uh, onions and uh, some items like uh, spice, uh, certain things, certain spices like that are kind of thought uh, very, very carefully during certain um, uh, Buddhist uh, calendar, like Tse Ge, Tse Chu, Nam Kang, depending upon the, uh, the moon position. Uh, but as far as Akubari is concerned, uh, I actually ha haven't <clears throat> heard much from uh, great practitioners. Uh, practitioners, uh, med med meditation practitioners, uh, sometimes I've actually uh, had an opportunity to sit with them and uh, had some conversation. Um, uh, chilies usually uh, don't matter that much, uh, especially um regarding to uh, you know uh, chilies like akubari and uh, i i got a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity uh, to talk with some of the uh, uh practitioners some sub practitioners that i wouldn't like to uh, call out their names uh and uh, in their practices uh, of course we're talking in terms of vajrayana uh practitioners uh, which 
this does not mean that it applies to all all the Buddhist practitioners. Uh, I would like mm -hmm. to make that very clearly. But for uh, Vajrayana practitioners, uh, uh, certain chili, certain flavors actually, certain flavors are uh, are quite helpful uh, to to focus. So that's that's a very interesting. I've been thinking this for a long, long time, and uh, mm -hmm. I've been also working on other. Uh, flavors and uh, smells, uh, like sun, mm -hmm. uh, right, which has right. got like uh, very many different collections of species. Uh, mm -hmm. In in sun collections, for example, like uh, in Rio Sangchi, uh, if, if it is possible, you can gather 108 different types of uh, varieties of uh, species. Uh, uh, and all has different flavor. And smell, uh, so that the smell has the potential to uh, kind of develop uh, for practitioners as as well as non practitioners to uh, guide or channelize their senses. Uh, so we talk again in sense of different types of senses here, but in in this in this term, the sense is kind of a, a positive uh, senses. Uh, so it can. Uh, it does have the, the flavor and the fragrance, which can uh, mm -hmm. uh, which can spark uh, certain types of uh, uh, meditative uh, focus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, we can talk. We can talk about different like flavors and senses. Uh, but for here, I I think from my own opinion and uh, some of the opinions shared by some of the masters. Uh, the, the pungency or the, the flavors uh, sometimes, depending upon what type of circumstances and what type of food you're dealing, uh, it does have positive effect in uh, meditative uh, practices. Uh, means not discriminating flatly. Right. Uh, yeah. If you be mindful, then you can help yourself with what type of uh, products and substances that you're using. Uh, mindfully, you can actually use them uh, very positively yeah i hope that answers uh the question yeah the, but yeah, pungency no, and akubari uh does have a unique uh sort of kind of a flavor and uh, you mm. know, smell mm -hmm. yeah it, it it does have i don't know how many of you have uh come in contact with the, the akubari but uh, mm. uh if you especially if you find the raw one you just chip it and you don't need to take it very close to your nose but you just slice it and just leave it there and you can get that uh mm -hmm. that flavor mm -hmm. a very distinct mm -hmm. flavor yeah. thank you wow. thank you uh next is uh kiki doma butia you can unmute yourself and ask the question Hello, uh, thank you so much for your talk and I I really missed like I was already missing home and looking at all the photos of food it like I was literally drooling here <laughs> but yeah thank you so much for your talk and I wanted to ask like very quickly like two questions like uh, um, I was wondering um, like I actually this was first time that I heard of like akubari as akubari like i always heard like since young i have always heard it as akarbari which is like very spicy chili i've never heard of akubari so it was completely new for me and i actually like was wondering like uh, whether you could uh, tell us more about whether you have found something to do with like a concept of uh, whether uh, uh, like akarbari or aku tom was in a way like uh, related to these supernatural entities um, in in particular like you know for example in most of my examples i have found out that like for example ajutak like grandfather tiger or something yes. like that uh, so in that context i was wondering because ajuta has always been like in mine like the stories that i have heard i found that there are this akutom and ajuta are especially like messenger or like a like a protector or of the yogis who are meditating in the forest of sikkim and he would like the tom and the ta will carry 
water to you know the yogis who are who are meditating or they are like the chef in the kitchen who would cook but i was wondering whether you have found some narrative because this akubari was completely new to me and i'm so interested and intrigued by it so i would love to hear more whether you have some narratives about some kind of supernatural like agency that they have or they are kind of a, like a protector or messenger to some supernatural like you know the guardian the yula jivda of mm. denjong whether there are something like that number one and if we have time like number two very quickly i wanted to ask uh, um uh, that <laughs> and i wanted to ask like you know uh for example uh, you mentioned that akubari have a you know, it's like in I, I I don't know much about multi-species environment, but from what I understood, it has some kind of like a very social and economical and political aspect attached to it. Like the society kind of a dictates how you see, uh, 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 like you know how you symbolize certain like object or animal in this cases. So I was wondering because, for example, Akubari in Sikkim is Akubari, and in Nagaland, as you mentioned, also like in other parts of Northeast, is called Bhut Jolokia, which means like devils, like like Jolokia means like burning devils or something like that. So somehow it seems like in other part of Northeastern India, it is kind of demonized, and in Sikkim, it's kind of you you are mentioning like something like mindfulness and some like meditation and things like you know panjensi in in Buddhist aspect. I was wondering whether it has a you know, very uh, social, uh, social, uh, you know, like a um, kind of like a way or like surrounding towards it. And if it is there, then let's see from Lupo's perspective or a Buddhist perspective, it kind of makes sense. But how do you explain it among other communities that are, you know, in majority, for example, like 75 percentage of the population are Nepali or let's say half of them are Hindus. Uh, so in this context, how does this narrative shifts or transform or how does it adjust in the in the current current scenario to I hope thank I you yeah thank you thank you thank you so much um yeah um I've been actually uh, you know attending to all these thoughts myself for uh some time now <laughs> uh so yeah these are some of the questions that uh, uh I have already uh you know gone through and uh you know I have actually talked with quite a lot of uh, uh, people from, especially in this context, I'm talking uh, about Denjong, Sikkim, uh, especially from the West Sikkim perspective. Uh, so it's, it's coming from Nub Dejong. So Nub Dejong's experience with, with the Akar, uh, with the, with the uh, Bari. Uh, so uh, yeah, it is very much, uh, uh, Nobdejo perspective about um, the concept Aku. And uh, as I've just, uh, you know, already talked in my paper, I think sometimes I think it wasn't clear uh, for that reason, uh, because uh, technology sometimes is not that dependable. Sometimes clarity, there's some problem with the clarity. Uh, so I'm very happy to share. Uh, so yeah, the concept Aku, uh, Aku is, um, it's a, <clears throat> I think all over Sikkim we use the term, but uh, especially in the West Sikkim context, uh, Aku actually is the, uh, the, the paternal uncle, you know, uh, and, and there's always this uh, kind of a, a gender role, uh, very much given to uh, the patriarchy uh, side. So, um, Akus in that way is kind of interrelated. They, I think they borrowed uh, the concept uh, and uh, because uh, Akus are not to be feared. Uh, I think the, the use of fear, I, I would strictly not use that in the human sense, <clears throat> in a human relate, relation. Uh, but it's something like uh, kind of Kind of a syncretic, you know. There's a there's a there's a so many things happening at the same time that you actually, when you have uh, a person whom you really aspire, or whom you really respect, and whom you think uh, they are very very, you know, uh, high in the sense in knowledge, wisdom, and who can impart 
are kind of a beautiful teachings and uh, life learning lessons. And at the same time, who can be a guide uh, in, in, in terms of uh, family, as well as domestic, as well as in spiritual religious sphere in, 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 in all sense. So um, I think from a Sikkimist uh, term, um, I think we look at Aku in, in that sense. You know, Aku is something who is, who is knowledgeable, who is, you know, who has got depth of information that who could uh, always come and protect and safeguard, you know, who, who is like very warm and who can actually take care of things out there, you know. So to, to those kind of people, you have some kind of, you know, there's, a, there's an inexpressible, some kind of, kind of a relation and a respect. Uh, and also at the same time, it can be a little bit of fear because like, you know, when generally it, turns, it tends to happen with many people. Like uh, in my own experience, when I meet my uh, religious, uh, you know, teachers or, or my uh, uh, teachers in, in terms of like uh, Dharma teachers, and also sometimes even with, uh, with, with, with teachers who teach other subjects, you know, and, and it's about uh, how, how beautiful they are, you know, how, how knowledgeable they are, and uh, how, uh, how a, a beauty transforms into something kind of a, a power and at the same time, a little bit of uh, a fear, uh, that kind of, kind of uh, exchange taking place. So from that sense, uh, I think uh, I think Sikkim is especially from a uh, West Sikkim context. Uh, I think they have that kind of a same respect uh, to to the Akutom, uh, which again it is a kind of a relatedness, interspecies relatedness, where uh, Akutom is. Uh, now in the modern day context, I think things are changing, but uh, during uh, back during like 1940s, 50s, uh, when I hear stories from uh, elderly people uh, and the stories that they told me uh, about how this, um, you know, these uh, creatures and animals in the jungle are not just ordinary, uh, uh, animals. Uh, they are uh, sometimes very much kind of, you know, uh, they can transform, they can manifest, and uh, they can be jidas, they can be yulas, and uh, they can be protectors of a region. So, in that sense, um, Tom bears coming out during 1930s and 40s is very rare. You know, and this also is a, a strong message for climate change and global warming, I think. Uh, in my other article, I have actually mentioned in detail about this. Um, so it sends a message. I think uh, during those days in 30s and 40s, you rarely actually hear uh, wild animals uh, venturing out in, in the human habitats. Uh, if by chance, sometimes once in a blue moon, if they happen to visit, uh, then they take it uh, differently. They think it like maybe, oh, the, the Yulla and the Jidas, maybe we must have agitated them, or uh, maybe we have done something, uh, maybe we have polluted the environment, or, or maybe we must have uh, sent some kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, smoke or, uh, or a pollution, you know, in a smoke pollution, maybe we must have burned something, uh, something very sensitive uh, so that they get agitated and they come out from the, uh, from the de deep, uh, dense forest to the uh, human habitat. So that way they have kind of a, a different perspective, different way of looking at it. Uh, but then, um, and sometimes when they meet them, uh, they are kind of, uh, like most of the time they don't attack, uh, but there are a few occasions that bears actually attack uh, humans, uh, depending upon uh, the situation. Uh, if, for example, they have burned something very sensitive, if they have burned uh, meat, for example, uh, or if they have burned 
uh, bones, cracked bones, and if they burned it, and if the smell gets spread out, and it goes right in the depth of the jungle, uh, it is really interesting. Actually, I have actually experienced this with my with myself. Uh, you know, wild animals. Forget about wild animals. Even cows, domesticated domesticated cows, get agitated and get really, really have a different reaction when they actually uh, reach to a spot where there is uh, a, a cow which has been slaughtered. Uh, you know, they could they could they could find the senses. They they're very sensitive, and they could react in such a way that they can even turn very violent. Uh, many occasions. So there's no, you know, there's a high probability that because of all these pollutions uh, through uh, smoke and, uh, you know, burnt objects, uh, you know, things can get very agitated and come out in human habitat and perhaps might even attack uh, innocent uh, beings. Uh, there are some uh, quite good examples about that. And uh, so, uh, that's the example of uh, 1930s, 40s. Uh, so that's that's one of the reason why uh, elderly people they say that if you in 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 case if you meet uh, Aku Tom, uh, because Tom has to be feared uh, in that sense because humans actually agitate them, you know they they agitated them, and uh, they get violent because because of human actions. So we need to. Uh, pay respect uh, and at the same time uh, like have a little bit sense of fear uh, you know because we actually agitate them um, so in the sense that uh, people during those days they don't like to uh, address to bear as Tom directly there's some kind of respect that they don't have the uh, guts to say uh, or tell his name, Tom. Nobody has the, uh, this is what the elderly used to uh, tell me. Why did they actually put the name Aku? Rather than saying Tom, which is a direct name, and uh, you know they, they actually have the respect, instead of saying Tom directly, they address the uh, bear as something like Aku. So in the village is very interesting when uh, when there's when when the bears come out, people generally don't say a bear has come out or Tom has Tom is there. Nobody would address that. They would say, "Oh, there's Aku," means everybody gets it. Aku has visited. <laughs> so that becomes a different language. You know, it's a kind of a uh, thing. So that's why I think. Uh, nobody wants to get attacked. Nobody wants to be uh, eaten or beaten by, by a bear. Uh, and, and at the same time, they have that fear and respect. And uh, that's why they have addressed as Aku, just like Aku from home, uh, who has got so much of responsibility and always addressed him as Aku. And the same, I think, term, they are, I think, kind of uh, using it in, in that sense. So, um, I think I've gone too much out there, <laughs> uh, but I can't no, uh, you. You know, avoid uh, because of the, the story, because this is what I've been told. Uh, and I've actually uh, lived with that experience uh, since, uh, since, since my childhood days. And mm -hmm. they would always use that uh, term as Akus. So in the recent, uh, in the recent uh, time, because of these topics, so I had to go back and uh, I thought of trying to put back all these things and. <laughs> trying to just tell a story you know? <laughs> um, yeah um, yeah now I, I can't remember about the second question <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, yeah so I think the relatedness and the interspecies relation uh, interspecies relation in this sense is I think it's very uh, significant uh, because in this time in this time of uh, climate change and global warming and the Anthropocene, where uh, humans are not only the, uh, you know, uh, the, the person <laughs> living in, in this environment, uh, whereas actually, I think, uh, I also quite agree with uh, Professor Gatsula uh, about how actually um, animals 
uh, and, and these creatures are very intelligent, actually. They are very intelligent. Uh, for example, uh, in the recent cases, uh, bears just coming out. Uh, you know, we have examples. This is actually why I got so interested in writing about this article is because all of our sicken, um, uh, you know, since it's been like uh, three, four years, that uh, there is a, a, a maximum of, uh, of bears uh, coming out of jungle and mm. they're mm. everywhere. They're in the kitchen gardens. Um, wow. yeah. and, uh, and, 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 and in some cases, they've even attacked uh, humans. Mm. And uh, mostly they have attacked uh, lots of other uh, uh, animals like Bears coming out and eating a whole house full of chickens, for example, you know, the, the poultry. They come and they finished up all the chickens uh, overnight. Uh, that happened in North Sikkim in Pensang, Pensang area, uh, where actually I went for a shop in, in Pensang Monastery and uh, happened to stay by a nearby monastery. And then the house where I stayed, uh, they had this experience about how bears came and they slept whole night in the kitchen garden. And the next night they went down to the neighbor's house and then they ate the whole, uh, you know, the, the poultry. And the next house, they even attacked like uh, pigs they ate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I think this is not just like bears, like being uh, brute and being very wildish. I think this is actually they're trying to tell us a message, uh, you know, telling us that you know, uh, there is an uh, kind of uh, intervention. You know, humans, you you'll have actually, uh, you know, crossed your limit and you have actually uh, trespassed in our place, mm. and you have made our life very difficult. And uh, right. you right. have hunted down all the species in the jungle and small uh, uh, mm. other, mm. you know, uh, animals. So we have nothing to eat. So where should we go? Uh, we will come to your kitchen garden, right. and <laughs> and and at the same time, I think also this uh, take the negative impact. I think some of the uh, elderly that they told me was that uh, because of the recent uh, human encroachment on Sikkimese land, uh, in the indigenous land, uh, especially about the the dams that I've talked about it. Uh, you know, there's a uh, whole loads of uh, dams in a small state like uh, you know, Sikkim, the area is so less, the population is just about uh, 600,000. Like in terms of Indian uh, uh, calculation, it's just like uh, six lakhs, which is nothing, uh, which is not even comparatively with the population of Chandini Chok in Delhi, which has got like 17, 18 lakhs. <laughs> Sikkim just has mm -hmm. like six point some lakhs of uh, humans living. But in, in that landscape, you have, uh, you know, uh, this is the heights of uh, greed, actually. Um, you have more than the landscape, you have tunnels. You, know, you have mega hydroelectricity uh, dams, which is right. too right. much, I think, for the land to bear. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and people have been experiencing, like, when, when, the, when there's a project going on, when the tunnel diggings are going on, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, pollution, especially in terms of noise pollution, and animals are very sensitive. So not only bears, we have been um, noticing many other species that which are not supposed to come out are there, uh, people have been noticing. So like, for example, uh, Himalayan uh, uh, Zik, uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, cheetah and uh, other uh, wild animals, they're, they're venturing out. And which is kind of, they're very sensitive and it's because of this tunneling and blastings that's taking place under the, under the surface, which, which agitates them and they become, they're very sensitive. So they come out, they venture out and, uh, you know, and humans are thinking like these are wild animals, you know, like, uh, and they're blaming the wild animal. Actually, in the sense that actually they are sending us a message. They're telling us that, um, you know, you people have cross, crossed your limit, you know. And uh, in the sense that uh, animals are actually giving us kind of a teachings, 
uh, about how to take care of our you know, natural surroundings and the environment, not to be too greedy, you know, just to balance and let you have your space and I have my space in that, like we can have a harmonious settlement. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, there's no way out that we have to come out. And uh, in that sense, they are very clever, actually. Uh, we humans, mm -hmm. actually, in the Anthropocene, like we, we are actually supposed to be the uh, dominant figure. We think that way. But in, in a long run, I think we are uh, comparatively with what they are going through, we are nothing. I think mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. selfish and mm -hmm. uh, not clever. You know, I don't like to right. put the word right. stupid, but uh, right. you know, in the end, we go down the drain, taking all of them, <laughs> you know, because of our, our doings and because of our not right. being yeah. mindfulness. Uh, so yeah, uh, so in that way, um, yeah, I hope, uh, I think I'll just stop there. I think just <laughs> controversy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that was really illuminating. And um, we actually are, unfortunately for this session, we're almost out of time. So we'll have to wrap up here. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, I need to organize a final session probably in May where all the speakers can come together and continue the conversation. And so, we'll try to find a time that works for all the speakers from this year's series. Uh, and that way we can keep going because <laughs> we could definitely keep talking for a long time about this. Um, thank you so much. And so let me, let me just, um, you know, end with some final words here. Um, let's see, am I spotlighted now? Um, so, just on Kelsang Lao, just on behalf of the Ho Center and also the Religion and the Public Sphere Initiative at the, the DSR, uh, we just want to thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming today and for participating. So it's been really, really wonderful. Um, and just thanks to my colleagues who have helped organize this. So, first to Francis Garrett, the co organizer of the series, uh, to our work study student, Kayla Boland, to uh, has just been so helpful from the beginning and we're so grateful for her contributions. Uh, to our new director, Sun Jung Kim, who couldn't be here today, but she's the new director of the Post Center. Uh, to Betsy Moss, thank you so, so much uh, for everything as the coordinator. And finally, to Sarah Richardson as the producer of the series. Um, Dekula is, is, is here today uh, and I'm very excited that she'll be giving a talk on March 24th. So please uh, attend that if you can. So again, the title of her talk is Mother Wisdom, learning to embody interdependence in the Anthropocene. Um, so with that, uh, we'll have to wrap up for today, but thank you everyone for coming. It was so illuminating. And Kelsey La, I really, really appreciate you joining us. It's super, super fascinating and I can't wait to hear more. Thank you, La. thank you. Could you see it? Lots of Lots of Everyone have a safe, uh, take care and be safe. Let's, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.